All right. Uh, hey, guys, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So today we're going to be looking at habit five. So this was something that we were going to look at last Thursday and we had to cancel the call. So wanted to make sure that we did touch on habit five. So habit four was win, win or no deal. That's such a, an important habit because what I'm, I'm continuing to um, see is that we tend to say, uh, you know, how do I make sure that um, it is a win-win? And yet sometimes what happens because, you know, as we looked at to have a win-win, you've got to have high consideration and high courage. And yet so often we find ourselves in a win-lose, right, where we have high consideration we don't have the courage to say, even though this is not a comfortable conversation, or I might have to grow myself or say this in a different way, we're not doing that. And then we end up in a lose, uh, a win-lose or a lose-win, and that's not what we're shooting for. So habit four, go back and revisit, and it ties beautifully into habit five, which is seek first to understand, then to be understood. Now, I bring this, you know, I want to make sure that when we look at habit five, seek first to understand, then to be understood. It doesn't stop at fe seek first to understand. It, then to be understood. Those are all, right? So it does not help if you understand and you're not understood and it does not help if, right? Like, are we looking at all of that? And a lot of that's going to be in our language and in our communication, right? Communication is the most important skill in life. Actually consider this, right? You spent years learning how to read and write and years learning how to speak. What about listening? What training have you had that enables you to powerfully listen so that you really deeply understand another human being from that individual's frame of reference? Now consider this, that also means that that person that you're speaking with probably hasn't had training that enables them to listen, to deeply understand you from your individual frame of reference, right? So seek first to understand or um, diagnose before you prescribe. That is the correct principle manifest in many areas of our life. Now, there's a great example in the seven habits of highly effective people. If you'll remember, the, um, uh, the person went to their optometrist and said, you know, I can't see. And the optometrist whipped off his glasses and handed it to them and said, here, um, I've had these for years. They've helped me plenty. And I've got another pair so you can have these. And the person puts on those glasses and says, it's still blurry. Matter of fact, it's worse. And the optometrist, um, well, why, why are you being like that? Like, this has worked for me. Why don't you use these? Um, you know, and you're like, well, I, I can't see. It's terrible. I can't see a thing. And, and then the optometrist says, well, just try harder. And you respond with, like, I'm trying harder, you, you know, and yet everything is a blur. And the optometrist comes back to you and goes, well, well, what's the matter with you? Think positively. Well, I'm positive. I can't see anything. And then the optometrist, well, you're just ungrateful. After all I've done for you, I gave you my glasses. Now, if this was your visit to the optometrist, what are the chances that you'd go back to see that optometrist again? The next time that you needed help, right? You wouldn't have much confidence in someone who doesn't diagnose before prescribing. So how often we, so how often do we diagnose before we describe in communication? See, we have such a tendency to rush in to fix things up with good advice. We often fail to take the time to diagnose, to really deeply understand the problem first, the challenge first. You know, Stephen Covey says the, the single most important principle in the field of interpersonal relationship, it would be this. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. Now, that principle is the key to effective interpersonal communication. Right? A wise doctor will diagnose before writing the prescription. The compassionate parent pauses to listening to listen before handing out discipline that may be unwarranted. Um, a great example of this, I'm in a car full of, of grown-ups and kids and on my Tahoe, and we're going around um, the lake. And some of the kids said something, and 
my little six-year-old nephew uh, in the back, Levi says, he's not a tit. And I turn around, what did you say? And he said, he's not a kid. Or I'm sorry, he said, he's a kid. I heard one thing and he had said kid. And yet because of his list, I heard something else. And I, man, whew, I was ready to tackle that. You can't say things like that about your little brother. And yet really what he was doing was he was defending his little brother because somebody called him a baby and he was saying he's a kid. Are we listening first? Now we talk about this in, in, you know, as a parent or that adult, this is when we're communicating with our clients, when we're communicating with those, the, the other agents in the transaction, this is when we are um, communicating with our administrators or our buyer's agents, right? An effective communicator will first seek to understand another's view before seeking to be understood. And yet those do go together. Right. Because next to physical survival, the greatest need of a human being is psychological in their psychological survivor survival. It is to be affirmed, to be appreciated and to be understood. And that's what's so important around this fifth habit. If you haven't already, make sure you go back in seven habits of highly effective people. Read habit four and habit five. Habit four. Right. Win win or no deal. And habit five is all around seek first to understand and then, and then to be understood. So how are you listening? How do you think other people would rate your listening skills? You might choose to do this, just go through, right? My best friend, low or high, your partner, a close family member, a team member, your team leader, right? Low or high? See, if you're like most people, you probably seek first to be understand, understood. It's a part of human nature. It is you desire to get your point across. And in doing so, you may ignore the other person completely. You might pretend you're listening, listening selectively here, only certain parts of the conversations. Pretend you're listening, right? We've all been in that conversation. Oh, 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 oh my gosh, I don't, I don't remember what they said. I don't know what they said. Um, are selectively hear only certain parts of the conversation. A few weeks ago, I found myself in a conversation with a family member, somebody that I highly respect. And I realized that we said a lot of the words you said, what you said was really that's that that's not listening, right? Because the word could mean something different to me than to that person. So are you taking a step back and making sure you're not getting triggered and asking, okay, you said X, is that what you meant? Or is, is that, tell me what that word means to you, right? Because in this scenario, he kept asking me another question, asked me another question. And I thought I was answering the question he was asking. No, no, no. We were completely different because we were both seeing it from our point of reference, right? And we were selectively hearing certain parts of the conversation. It wasn't about seeking first to understand, understand and then to be understood. So make certain, are we attentively focusing, right? We wanna make sure that we're, we're focusing not only on the words being said, because then we might miss the meaning entirely. So why does this happen? Well. Because most people, again, we listen with the intent to reply and not to understand. You listen to yourself as you prepare in your mind what you're going to say, the questions you're going to ask. One of the main reasons for this is that you filter everything you hear through your own autobiography, your life experiences, your frame of reference. In one course uh, that I participated in, we talk about you're already always listening right? So your brain, its job is to filter things out. So somebody says something, he goes, Ooh, oh, you've already heard that. This is the answer. You already know that this is the answer. Um, in this particular course, it was uh, interesting because the, um, the gentleman that was lecturing, he started out and he asked the question, who considers yourself a good listener? 
sure I do. And then he said, you know, how many times have you been talking to somebody and man, you knew what they were going to say. You just filled that, filled in what they were going to say. I, oh man, I almost broke my arm off, patting myself on the back. And then he stopped and said, if you're doing that, you're not a good listener. It's all about you. And I paused and I thought about that. And I went, oh my goodness, that's right. Because if they're making a statement and I think I know what they're going to say, then my already always listening is already there. It's already my autobiography, my life experience. What do I think they're going to say? I may fill in a word that wasn't their word or had a different meaning. And now we're having a different conversation, right? So we want to make sure that we step back. Um, and make certain that we allow them to communicate and really understand it from their point of reference, right? Um, something that, um, as I was rereading the seven habits of highly effective people, and we were looking at habit five, something that jumped out. Whenever we have a problem with someone, our attitude is that person, they, they just don't understand. Now, Covey shares the story of a father saying, you know, I came up to Covey and said, you know, I just, I can't understand my kid. He won't listen to me. And Covey replied, well, let me restate what you just said. So you don't understand your son because he won't listen to you. And the father said, yeah, you're right. Covey says, let me try that again. You don't understand your son because he won't listen to you. And of course, the dad says, well, that's what I said. Covey replies, I thought to understand another person, you needed to listen to him. Ah, light bulb, right? And yet then the dad continues to go, but I don't understand him. I mean, I went through the same thing myself. I guess what I don't understand is why won't he listen to me? This dad was missing the point. He didn't have the vaguest idea of what was really going on inside his son's head, right? Because he looked into his own head and he thought he saw the world, including that, that boy. We tend to do this, right? Like when they were said this, it was like, oh, you know, we, you may be like me and you're like, Ooh, that feels like that story is about me, right? They won't listen to me. They won't, wait a minute. The job of the person that's communicating is to communicate it in such a way that they can hear, that they can understand, right? And yet we get so filled with our own rightness, our own autobiography, and so we just want to be understood. Our conversations become collective monologues, and we never really understand what's going on inside of another human being. And yet it seek first to understand then be understood. So we want to make certain that when we're tempted to say, oh, they won't listen or they don't understand or, or they don't get it, right? We want to back up and go, wait a minute. What am I not communicating? What do I not understand about where they're coming from? Let me understand that piece. That's when your world opens up. Now, some of you might be saying, wait a minute, right? Uh, I'm just trying to relate the relate to this person by drawing on my own experiences. Is that so bad? Now, you may have very sincere desires. True listening means that you forget about yourself and concentrate all of your energies on being with the other person in real time. This is actually called um, empathic listening, empathic listening. So, just be patient here because what I'm sharing with you is what Covey shares, right? And he's really trying to help you with a paradigm shift here because you so often listen autobiography, biographical, because you so often listen autobiographically. Whoa, I cannot say that word. You listen from your own point of view. You tend to respond in one of four ways, right? We're going to evaluate. We either agree or disagree. We probe, we ask questions from our own point of reference. We advise, you give counsel and solutions to problem based on your own experience. And we interpret, right? You try to figure people out, you explain their motives and behaviors based um, 
on their own motives and behaviors. So that's typically, this is all about us, right? We evaluate, you're wrong. No, don't do that. Uh, we probe, um, why would you do that? What about that, right? Um, and we advise, oh, well, you know, if you could have done this or you should have done that, or we interpret, right? We try to figure out people out, um, explaining their behavior. Um, well, that's, the, again, that's all about, that's all about us. So if we, you know, let's do a quick exercise, right? So uh, let's say Joyce says, my family didn't take my, didn't like my idea for a vacation. And Carla says, well, next time if I were you, I'd talk to Beth about it first. She always seems to know the best thing to do. So Carlos, right, he advised, because we look at, did he evaluate, probe, advise, or interpret? He advised. Well, that may not have been what Joyce was looking for, right? Um, another example, uh, Joyce, same thing. Mitch, though, Mitch says, I'm sure the only reason they didn't like it is because it was going to cost way too much. Don't take it personally. Well, Mitch is interpreting. He doesn't know that, right? He wasn't there. Um, that's from his point of reference. Again, what about Kayla? She hears the same thing and she says, well, did you let your husband know about your idea before you told everyone? She's probing. And then what about Melanie? Well, yeah, you know, that can happen if you don't spend much time thinking about it first. She's interpreting. Now, there are times for these, and yet we want to make sure that it's not all about us. See, people are so deeply scripted in these types of responses, they don't even realize when they use them. When you use them at the right time with the right intent, they can be productive. Usually, autobiographical responses force your opinion on others, and sometimes you may be perceived as intrusive or unwilling to understand. So even if your intention is to help, giving advice or, or evaluating without being asked can backfire in the long run. So it might be, Joy says, my family didn't take, didn't like my idea for a vacation. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Do you want me to, you know, are you are sharing that because you'd like to um, create a solution or you want me to listen? Right, like find out. And then even from her point of reference, you know, it's not for us to fix that. So often I think that's really what we're doing when we're evaluating, probing, and advising, and interpreting. We're fixing it. The thing is, is we're fixing it from our point of reference. I mean, it had nothing to do with what they are, are looking for. So you have the right to remain silent. We hear this so often that you really do. So when we look at empathic listening, um, genuine listening means suspending memory, desire, and judgment, and for moments at least, existing from the other person. The highest form of, of listening is called empathic listening. Now, this is not sympathy. Right. Sympathy is a form of agreement. It's a form of judgment. And it's sometimes the more appropriate emotional response. Yet people often feed on sympathy. It makes them dependent. Empathic listening gets you inside another person's frame of reference. You look out through it. Right. You see the world the way he or she, she sees it and you understand how she or he feels. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that you agree. It's that you fully, deeply understand that person emotionally as well as intellectually. You temporarily let go of your perspective to understand his or her perspective. Now, empathic listening is not about just listening with your ears, right? It's about listening with your eyes and your heart. When you and others speak, the meaning you communicate from comes from three sources, right? The words that you use, your body language, and how you say your words. Listening with your eyes means you pick up on nonverbal cues that another is communicating through his or her body language. Listening with your heart means you listen for feeling and meaning that is expressed through the tone and inflection of another's voice, right? We call this tonality uh, when we in bold. And listening with your ears is simply hearing the actual words that are being said. Now, it's important to remember that more than 90% of what people communicate does not come through words. It comes through that nonverbal communication, such as tone of voice and body language. 
So this is where that paradigm shift usually occurs for people. See, communication is not just about words. Empathic listening is so powerful because it gives you accurate data to work with. So instead of projecting your own autobiography and assuming thoughts, feelings, emotions, interpretations, you're dealing with the reality inside another person's head and heart. You're focused on receiving that deep communication from another human soul. And in addition, empathic listening is the key to making deposits in emotional bank accounts, right? Um, in um, uh, Covey, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Habit 3, we looked at that, making emotional bank account uh, deposits. Nothing you do is a deposit unless the other person perceives it as such. Well, I did so much for you. I gave you blah, blah. Well, may not have been the thing that that person needed, wanted, or considered a deposit, right? You can work your fingers to the bone to make a deposit, only to have it turn into a withdrawal when a person regards your efforts as manipulative, self-serving, intimidating, or condescending because you don't understand what really matters to that other person. Empathic listening is, in and of itself, a tremendous deposit in that emotional bank account. It's deeply therapeutic and healing because it gives a person psychological air. See, if all the air were suddenly sucked out of the room you're in right now, what would happen to your interest in what I'm saying? Zero, right? You wouldn't care at all. You wouldn't care about anything except getting air. Survival would be your only motivation. Now, when you have air, doesn't motivate you. This is one of the greatest insights in the field of human motivation, right? Satisfied needs do not motivate. It's only the unsatisfied need that motivates. So next to physical survival, the greatest need of a human being is psychological survival, to be understood, to be affirmed, to be validated, to be appreciated. See, when you listen with empathy to another person, you give that person psychological air. And after that vital need is met, you can then focus on influencing or problem solving, right? We talk about meet them where they are. Yeah, this need, this need for psychological air impacts communication in every area of life. Um, again, in the seven habits of highly effective people, um, Covey actually demonstrates this and it's pretty powerful because he talks about, I'm flipping to that page. He talks about a conversation, um, with his, uh, with his, uh, our, our conversations we can have, uh, with our children. Now, what's interesting is how much this absolutely, um, applies to all areas of our world, right? So you can think of this conversation with anyone. Because um, we want to look, I want to just share this with you because we want to look at not just the words, the thoughts and feelings expressed, right? So um, a son goes to his father, boy, dad, I've had it. School is for the birds. So if you think about it, and what Covey says is the, the son actually says, I want to talk with you to get your attention. And this, the, 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 the father says, what's the matter, son? Right. He's saying I'm interested, which is good. Right. And the son says, it's totally impractical. I don't get a thing out of it. What he really saying is I've got a problem with school and I feel just terrible. And the father says, well, you just can't see the benefits yet, son. I felt the same way when I was your age. Oh no. Here comes, right the dad's autobiography. And so the kid might be thinking, this isn't what I want to talk about. I don't really care how many miles you had to trudge through snow to school without any boots. Does that make sense? Right? Because I know how you fit, right? Does he? Um, and so then the dad says, I remember thinking what a waste some of the classes were, but those classes turned out to be the most helpful to me later on. So just hang in there, give it some time. Maybe the son's saying, time won't solve my problem. I wish I could tell you. I wish I could just spit it out. So the son says, I've given it 10 years of my life. Can you tell me what's good? X plus Y is, is going to do me as an auto mechanic. The dad, an auto mechanic? You got to be kidding. 
Maybe he just got triggered. And the kid's thinking, he wouldn't like me if I were an auto mechanic. He wouldn't like me if I didn't finish school. I have to justify what I just said, right? So now all of a sudden that that the son is, is fighting for a belief that may not even have been a belief, except he wants to say, no, no, no. I got to convince you, dad, why this is okay, because that means I'm okay. And so the son says, no, I'm not. Look at Joe. He's quit school. He's working on cars and he's making lots of money. Now that's practical, right? He's justifying. And so uh, the dad, it may look that way now, but several years down the road, Joe's going to wish he'd stayed in school. Oh boy, here comes lecture number 16 on the value of an education, right? You don't want to be an auto mechanic. Now, Ken, now we're telling that kids probably thinking, well, how do you know, dad? Do you really have an idea, any idea what I want? You need an education to prepare you for something better than that. And the kid looks, you know, I don't know. Joe's got a pretty good setup. He's saying, the kid's really saying, Joe's not a failure. He didn't finish school and he's not a failure. He's worthy of love. And the dad says, look, son, have you really tried? And the son, we're beating around the bush, dad. If you just listen, I really need to talk to you about something important. And the kid says, I've been in high school two years now. Sure, I've tried. It's just a waste. And the dad, because we're in the telling mode, right? Autobiographical. That's a highly respected school, son. Give them a little credit. Okay, so great. So now we're talking credibility. I wish I could just talk about what I wanted to talk about. And so the son, I'm not a moron, right? In his head, I have some credibility too. Well, the other guys feel the same way that I do. Then they get that. Do you realize how many sacrifices your mother and I have made to get you where you are? Uh-oh, here comes the guilt trip. Now, I, I, I want to read, I read that to you straight out of the book because I wanted you to think about, um, are is there a possibility that this is some of our conversations, right? Um, and now we're dealing with a lot. We talk about dealing with the smoke and not the fire, right? Most people are actually, you know, they, they, they die from the smoke. And yet, aren't you, you know, not the fire. Aren't you glad that when the firefighter shows up, he puts out the fire, which stops the smoke. If he showed up and he was just dealing with the smoke, he would still die right? So we want to, we want to make sure that we're looking at this and going, what can we learn from this when we're having a conversation with our admin, with those, those very key important people in our lives, our spouses, our significant others, right? So I just thought that was really good to kind of see what somebody's saying and how we, sometimes our words will paint them to a corner where they feel like they have to justify, which means now they're holding on to the, their way of thinking because they're trying to prove something to you. And maybe you're holding on the way that you see things because we're not really listening. We're not, we're not doing attentive listening, um, right? So we want to make sure uh, that we're looking at it from that other person's reference. So I'm going to move forward um, to a really great piece of, of what he shares um, and opening this up. So same scenario, right? Now, this is the, the fourth stage, empathic listening skills, which is really incredible. As you authentically seek to understand, as you rephrase content and reflect feeling, you give the person that you're talking to psychological air. You also help uh, that person work through their own thoughts and feelings. And then as they grow in confidence of your sincere desire to really listen and understand, that barrier between what's going on inside of that person and what's actually being communicated to you disappears. It opens that soul to soul flow. He's not thinking and feeling one thing and communicating another. That person begins to trust you with their innermost tender feelings and thoughts. So this is what this looks like. Boy, dad, I've had it. School is for the birds. Again, the son is saying, I wanna, I wanna talk to you to get your attention. And the dad says, you're really frustrated about school. The other person, yeah, that's right. That's what I feel. I'm, I'm frustrated. I sure am. It, it's totally impractical. impractical. I'm not getting a thing out of it. So the dad, you feel like school's not doing you any good. 
So that gives that that person time. Wait, let me think. Is that what I meant? Well, yeah, I'm just not getting, I'm not learning anything that's going to help me. I mean, look at Joe. He's dropped out of school and he's working on cars. He's making money. Now that's practical. The dad, you feel that Joe really has the right idea? The son, well, I guess he does in a way. He's really making money now. In a few years, I bet he'll probably be ticked, he'll probably be ticked off at himself. So you think Joe's going to feel he made the wrong decision? The son? Well, he's got to. I mean, just look at what he's given up. I mean, if you don't have an education, you just can't make it in this world. The dad? So education is really important. The son? Oh, yeah. I mean, if you don't have a diploma, if you can't get jobs or go to college, what are you going to do? You've, you've just got to get an education. The dad? So it's important to your future. The son? What well, is? And and you know what? I'm really worried. Listen, you won't tell mom, will you? So you don't want your mom to find out? Well, I mean, not really. I mean, I guess you can tell her. She'll probably find out anyways. Look, I took this test today, this reading test, and dad, they said I'm reading on a fourth grade level. Fourth grade, and I'm a junior in high school. Now, look at the difference that conversation made, the difference in real understanding. All of the well-meaning advice in the world won't amount to a hill of beans if when we're not even addressing the right problem. And we'll never get to the problem if we're so caught up in our own autobiography, our own paradigms, that we don't take off our glasses long enough to see the world from another person's point of view. The kid says, you know what, Dad, I'm going to flunk. I guess I figure if I'm going to flunk, I might as well quit. I don't want to quit. The dad, you feel torn. You're in the middle of a dilemma. The kid, what do you think I should do, dad? See, by seeking first to understand, this father has just turned a transactional opportunity into a transformational opportunity. Instead of interacting on a surface, get the job done level of communicating, he has created a situation in which he can now have transforming impact, not only on his son, also own the relationship. Now I'm going to stop there, but that's why I'm, I just I cannot stress enough, right? We've been working on the seven habits of highly effective people for a few months now. Read this, look at this, look at those people in your own conversations, in your own world. Are we having those conversations autobiography, you know, uh -huh. From our point of reference, are we really paying attention and listening to it from their frame of reference? Okay. So again, seek first to understand. This is diagnosing before you prescribe. And it's hard, right? It's much easier in the short run to hand someone that pair of glasses uh, that fit you so well, and yet it depletes so much, right? If you think back to that goose and the golden egg uh, that Covey shares earlier in the book, effectiveness lies in balance, what is referred to as the PPC balance, right? P is for production of desired results, the golden eggs, and PC for production capability, the ability or asset that produces the golden egg. You can achieve maximum interdependent production from an, uh, from an inaccurate understanding of where other people are coming from. And you can't have interpersonal PC, high emotional bank accounts, if the people you relate with don't really feel understood. Empathic listening takes a great deal of security to go into a deep listening experience because you open yourself to be influenced. So we talked about the three basic skills, right? In that story, we rephrased content, we reflected feelings, we asked questions for better understanding, right? These skills are only the, the, the tip of the iceberg when it comes to empathic listening, right? So again, are you really digging in to make sure that we're listening? And then we've listened. We've sought first to understand. Now it's time to be understood. So knowing how to be understood is the other half of habit five and is equally critical in reaching win-win solutions, right, from habit four. See, last week we defined maturity as the balance between courage and consideration. Seeking to understand requires consideration. Seeking to understand takes courage. Win-win requires a high degree of both. So it becomes important in interdependent situations for us to be understood. 
Covey shared a story when an acquaintance uh, shared that he was very frustrated with his boss and he felt his boss had an unproductive leadership style. So that the acquaintance asked Covey, well, why doesn't he do anything? I've talked to him about it. He's aware of it. He does nothing. To which Covey asked, well, why don't you make an effective presentation? And the, the manner was, I did. So Covey asked a great question. How do you define effective? Why do they send us... Uh, who do they send back to school when the salesperson doesn't sell? The buyer? No. Effective means it works. So did you create the change you desired? Did you build the relationship in the process? What were the results of your conversation? And this gentleman replied, well, the, the guy, he didn't do anything. He wouldn't listen. So Covey then says again, then make an effective presentation. You've got to empathize with his head. You've got to get into his frame of mind. You've got to make your point simply and visually and describe the alternative he is in favor of better than he can himself. Take some homework. Are you willing to do that? And in this uh, example, the gentleman wasn't really to do that. He didn't know why he would need to do all that. And Covey says, so in other words, you want him to change his whole leadership style and you're not willing to change your method of delivery, your method of presentation. So when you're not being effective, are you asking yourself, what do I need to know? What do I need to adjust? What do I need to change in my delivery, in my presentation? So how do you know when you're effective? Is your definition of effective communication, does it mean that it worked? And if it doesn't, are you digging further into that? So we're going to stop here. Um, again, go back through the material. Uh, Covey does an amazing job of really laying this out so that we understand it and, and looking at this and going, okay, how am I, those people that um, I'm not effectively communicating with, right? Maybe you went on a, a listing appointment and you didn't take the listing. Or they wouldn't agree, you know, they, they could not understand the price that you are sharing with them. Do you understand why that's important to you? Do you understand what they're saying even beyond the words that you're, they're using? Are you really looking at it from their point of view? So um, that's what we're going to wrap today. This again, this is around step five. Seek first to be understood. Sorry, see, I messed that one up. Seek first to understand, then seek to be understood. All right, that's how we make sure that we are creating win-win um, agreements for those involved. All right, so that's where we're going to wrap. If you guys have uh, any questions, feel free to call me, text me, email me. Um, and then this uh, Thursday, we will actually be together um, and we're going to um, wrap up the seven habits of highly effective people. I'm talking with you soon. Have a great one.